Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I'm delighted you're able to join us again. Uh, we're going to move on to our next session. But before I do, just a couple of quick reminders. You should see the chat function on the left. Please feel free to introduce yourself. Uh, you can have a real-time conversation uh, about the session during, um, during the presentation. Also, if you have questions, please make sure for our, for our speaker, please make sure you put them in the Q&A tab uh, so we can be sure to see those and address them if we have time. Uh, and now I'm delighted to, to introduce our next speaker for our panel, for our presentation, Designing a Co-Promote for Success, Effective Alliances and Joint Commercialization. And our speaker is Cody Powers. He's a principal at ZS Associates. I'm gonna turn it over to Cody. Thanks, Stephanie. Nice to, uh, to meet everyone here today. Thank you for joining. Uh, I think this this particular topic uh, is something that uh, inside of, uh, of ZS, uh, introduce us, our firm, for those who are not familiar, uh, in a bit, but uh, we've been focused on, I think, for the last couple of years, essentially uh, maybe coming out of past battle uh, battle scars where people have had either, either a good or a negative experience. Uh, what are some of the things that we've learned about what it takes to make a co-promote successful, not just you know financially successful in terms of term sheet, but operationally successful as well in the pull through on the, uh, on the back end? Uh, for those, um, I think we're uh, we're starting off with our, our polling question here. Uh, for those who've uh, who've been involved with a co-promote before, uh, maybe uh, just a quick poll question here: yes or no? If you have been, I think uh, we're trying to get to better understand our our audience and participation in uh, in polls here, or excuse me, in prior co-promotes. So if you could just kind of click on the screen here: yes, no, unsure, uh, and hopefully we can get kind of a clear click readout here on the uh, on the audience and where things stand. Uh, I'm kind of looking at the uh, results as, as they go here. It looks like actually a pretty even uh, even split of the audience, I think, that I'm seeing so far. OK, so that's, uh, that's good. We want people who've, who've been on both sides of the uh, equation. It's actually like the majority have. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, I think, close out the uh, the poll here, I think, if, uh, if we could do that. Yeah, so roughly a 50-50 split of uh, people who've been involved and not involved. So great, thank you for uh, for selecting uh, your poll options here. Now we'll kind of proceed and, and uh, understand a little bit better what's involved with a co-promote. Uh, for those not familiar with uh, with ZS, uh, we're a, a global consulting firm, uh, predominantly life sciences and healthcare focus, about 7,000 people uh, globally and about 27 offices. You can kind of see the uh, list uh, down below. Uh, I think in terms of our, uh, our expertise, uh, historically focused on strategy commercialization, and then uh, we have a technology and operations vertical as well. So, uh, in terms of our uh, our topics here today, uh, my uh, screen's a little frozen. Yep, there we go. Uh, I think a couple of uh, of flavors that we'll go through. I think the one uh, to start with is just kind of anchoring on what. What do co promotes look like at aggregate, and then some particular case studies to help us understand what other companies have done, the reasons that they've made choices that they have. A second, we'll abstract a bit and understand how to design successful co-promotes. What are some of the things that we would weigh and some of the uh, the choices that we have to make, both from the standpoint of, for example, a large uh, cap player, Fortune 500 player, as well as a development stage company. You know, If you were trying to build for the first time, what would you uh, be deciding or choosing between when you make certain design choices? Uh, the goal of that, of course, is in our third step, we'll talk about how to maximize value for both parties in the transaction, essentially a mutually agreeable uh, solution that is designed to last, so to speak, as opposed to things that may just look like good on paper from a standpoint of a term sheet. And then also talk about when things don't go well. So co-promotes obviously have a number of challenges. They can result in some friction. How do we resolve some of the deadlocks that historically obviously can cripple the uh, long-term outcome of a co-promote? So just so we've got the definitions uh, right here, uh, the fundamental uh, uh, nature of a co-promote as we are talking about it here is that there are two companies who are combining what we're calling commercial and customer facing resources. So this is not a licensing deal if if uh, you've out licensed a product or in license a product where one side or the other is dominating and, uh, and the other essentially is just um, uh, participating as part of a, uh, an alliance management function. Uh, that's not what we're focused on here today. We're focused on where there's two companies that are coming together uh, for joint commercial and customer-facing purposes. So you could say the uh, the examples of what, what would typically be in a co-promote 
deal uh, and in some ways looks very similar to a, a licensing transaction. The key difference I think here is that on the responsibility front, we'll go into a, a lot more detail here. There's just a whole lot more information ideally. So for example, who's bringing Salesforce responsibility to the table? Who's responsible for medical affairs? Who's responsible for handling pricing and market access discussions? That's the kind of detail that you typically go into a co mode as opposed to maybe an alliance management function where uh, where you would typically uh, not be involved quite as much day-to-day -day if you were, say, the company that's giving up rights. Uh, as far as why companies uh, historically participate in co promotes, I think there's there's uh, benefits, I think, for both commercial and development stage companies. I think for the standpoint of a commercial stage company, obviously, there's revenue upside, improving the economics by the portfolio synergy, and particularly in cases where they don't necessarily have an obvious pipeline asset to fill the gap. Um, there's, uh, of course, uh, ability to build out their, uh, their corporate capabilities uh, more completely. And frankly, filling in capacity gaps, you know, for example, an underproductive commercial organization that maybe only has one product, they have the capacity to handle more. Uh, the, uh, the, the secret also is for commercial stage companies, oftentimes when you're striking these deals, particularly with a development stage company, it's a try before you buy. So the extent to which, you know, you see, uh, you see a particular asset, maybe the development stage company is not willing to engage in a takeover offer. You know, sometimes a, a co-promote is a happy medium and you know, may give you insight as to what a potential takeover could look like down the road if proven successful. Uh, for pre-commercial stage companies, of course, it's first and foremost that usually you're looking for access to non-dilutive capital, sharing some of the both commercial and development stage risk. Uh, as far as um, the ramp up, you know, usually a development stage company is very focused on what functions do I need to build up from scratch, right? They have nothing. And so sometimes we see pre-commercial stage companies engaging on the basis of, well, this lets me essentially piecemeal to build up, e.g., you know, instead of hiring 100, 150 Salesforce uh, folks, I would hire 75. Or instead of me having to complete a complete build out and cover every payer, you know, maybe I cover half. You know, I think those are the kinds of conversations that we have with pre-commercial stage companies who are essentially using it as a way to get their feet wet, but not necessarily swallow commercial whole up. So let's talk about some overall trends in the co-promote environment. Um, I think we, we looked at data from 2015 to 2019 uh, to kind of understand the nature of, of all co-promotes that, uh, that have been struck. So uh, in terms of how we did that, we looked at essentially all NMEs and equivalent BLAs, uh, and we tried to filter deals, obviously, that are, are co-promote nature. So you can imagine there's actually a fair amount of work to, to filter out things that look like a co-promote, but actually are out licensing deals or, or vice versa. Uh, you can see there just kind of an example list of 2019 deals. I think there are some, obviously, that uh, that would jump to the top of the list. You're familiar with them from personal experience, perhaps. But the vast majority of co-promotes, you know, you may not actually know about. I think there's actually a surprisingly long tail of co-promotes that, uh, that are not necessarily front page news, per se. Uh, all in, our, our sample is about 137 co-promote transactions over the uh, five-year period. In terms of uh, number of deals, I think kind of an interesting trend we observed, uh, you know, historically 2015 to 2017, about 32, 33 deals a year on average. Uh, we saw a significant decrease in 2018 and 2019. Um, the, the question is, why is this? Uh, obviously, we have a lot of, of question marks. Is there something specific to the macro environment in those two years? You know, it's kind of a, a benchmark here. If you look at the number of licensing deals, the number of licensing deals over the same time period did see uh, a, a essentially mid single digit decline. If you look at uh, on value, overall value certainly increased and the value per deal increased. So you have essentially a uh, fewer number of, of uh, transactions being struck but a higher value. Uh, and the co-promote setting, obviously the, it's on a smaller basis, but you can see a much more market decline. So there's a few reasons for this that we'll, uh, we'll talk about. You can think of the, the lion's share of it though is a lot of these co-promote deals are, are struck with, uh, with development stage companies uh, on one hand and with a commercial partner on the other. And as the fundraising environment improved over the last uh, several years, and as the type of indication and asset that these development stage companies are bringing through, they're essentially increasingly focused or targeted type of, uh, of circumstances. So for example, a biomarker driven asset, an asset with a, naturally a smaller patient population, either in oncology or rare disease, some autoimmune disease, such that uh, because they're able to better swallow whole hog, there isn't as much of a, a need necessarily to look for a co-promote partner where they'd be essentially splitting things on average 50-50. Um, the uh, plurality of deals 
our, uh, our oncology. So you can see there uh, the bottom right that uh, about uh, 66, I think, deals uh, in oncology. Obviously, the, the rest of the graph there has a pretty long tail. Uh, and that, not surprisingly, the majority of these deals are in the U.S. Uh, an, an often seen dynamic for global co-promote deals, you typically see a, a U.S. co-promote with a, uh, you know, whoever the, the larger partner is taking over a complete ex-U.S. rights. It's a very common engagement. Uh, I think what's uh, one, one thing that is interesting, if you look at uh, co-promote rights, I think one uh, the nature of when is it a co-development deal versus just co-promote only is actually about 50-50. Uh, and then second, in terms of the stage of the deal, while uh, marketed deals uh, are certainly uh, very common, that you actually have a fairly even distribution across stages when a deal was struck. Uh, so I think co-promote deals you would have expected, I think, or at least we expected to see the majority that were in later stages of, uh, of development. And actually, it's, it's not as uh, uniform or it's not as, as pointed as that. It's actually relatively spread out. All right, so we're going to look at a couple of, uh, of case studies here on uh, co-promotes that, that may have gone well or, or not have gone well, depending on your perspective. So first, uh, in terms of, um, of recognizable examples, hopefully these two uh, are, uh, are ones people are familiar with. I think one, Xtandi, obviously, also originally between Medivation and Astellas, now currently between Pfizer and Astellas. This is a uh, uro-oncology asset focused on uh, prostate cancer. Uh, the agreement originally struck in 2009 and launched the asset was launched in 2012. Uh, and Bruvica, obviously, I, I think uh, kind of a, a wonder story in terms of exit valuation, originally between Pharmacyclics and Janssen, now currently with, uh, with AbbVie and, and Janssen. Uh, an agreement struck for a hematology asset in uh, 2011 and then uh, subsequently launched in, uh, in 2013. Uh, so first, uh, with Medivation and Estellas, I think the, the context behind this deal, I think, is, uh, is very important. So for um, Medivation, um, this was their what we call first launch, meaning this was the first time that they are bringing an asset in their pipeline as an emerging state uh, biotech and bringing it to commercialization where they'll actually have their own people supporting the asset. Um, so and from their perspective, part of the motivation is, of course, to leverage uh, a larger partner's knowledge and experience, for example, Estellas and Urology. But the reality is the commercial build here would have been perhaps larger than average for many development stage companies. And therefore, you can see it's, it's somewhat of a divide and conquer. So in urology, for uro-oncology, for those who are not familiar, typically you're covering urologists and oncologists. So you can imagine, you know, some of a de facto design might be one side covers urologists, one side covers your oncologists. Uh, for Astellas, I think they used Xtandi essentially to, uh, as a kind of a, a pivot point and as a cornerstone for their oncology franchise, essentially moving beyond their urology and transplantation focus historically. Uh, of course, there would have been significant synergy with a uh, urology business, uh, but they did have um, uh, several assets, I think, lined up coming out of their oncology portfolio that would potentially uh, pick up some synergy in both directions. Uh, and then last, of course, in this deal that uh, Stellas picked up the XUS rights as well. On the bottom, you can see the financial structure of this uh, these particular transaction, maybe a couple of items to pull out. Uh, development costs were actually split where uh, Estellas bore the majority as opposed to 50-50 uh, everywhere else. Uh, at least in cases where the U.S. and ex-U.S. Uh, were both improved or affected by a particular trial. Uh, overall, this is a profit share agreement in co-promote geographies, namely the, uh, the U.S. Uh, I think last, in terms of, uh, of decision rights, uh, the, the agreement was kind of spelled out as by consensus first, uh, but with no, uh, at least publicly stated, a resolution mechanism. So we'll talk more about that in a minute and why, why it's important to have a resolution mechanism. It's possible that there was there was one uh, spelled out in documents that have not been made public, but it's uh, in terms of public documentation, not released. So in terms of how this deal played out, you can see, uh, at least from the overall perspective of, uh, of motivation, you know, they, they, for a while, were focused on another asset, asset eventually had to pivot to uh, Xtandi following a, a major uh, uh, clinical trial setback. Uh, you can see here kind of the rapid growth of, uh, of revenue, of course, uh, at any particular stage here for a development stage company who had just made a co-promote deal, you expect to see significant upfront or milestone payments the first several years. But most notably, obviously, the extended revenue itself grew very quickly as, uh, in terms of uh, encroachment and becoming a standard of care. So uh, I think from uh, from that standpoint, you can see uh, that, uh, uh, that Medivation was able to kind of use the platform here to start boosting 
their own development pipeline. So you can see some of the acquisitions that they made across the top. Uh, and then in terms of, of uh, I think items on the bottom there, uh, most important, if you look at the commercial effort, usually we can use Salesforce numbers as kind of a proxy for commercial uh, for commercial effort. Uh, there, perhaps most of interest, you would have expected Mastellus is the larger company to dominate the effort. Um, actually, that was not the case. Uh, I think Medivation actually supplied the majority of resources and that to the best of our understanding, based on publicly stated information, that it was not one side did onks, the other side did euros, e.g., um, that uh, Medivation does onks and, and Estellas did euros. They actually split. They both they covered both. And so from that uh, from that standpoint, uh, I think kind of an in, u- interesting situation where uh, both sides wanted to grow on both vectors in terms of both customer bases, as opposed to just kind of picking out one that would be important to their either their future or their past, and uh, and that would be potentially a natural starting point for something else in the future, and wanting to make sure that they're not overly concentrated on one customer base or the other. To uh, kind of contrast that with another story, uh, pharmacyclics, I, th- I think, often framed as a, as a wonder child of sorts, obviously a very attractive exit to uh, eventually to AbbVie. Uh, one of the things I think that's, that's often lost in the pharmacyclic story, uh, pharmacyclics had a large development program before this Copermote deal was struck. So in some ways, uh, the Copermote program here, you can imagine that uh, even relative to other examples, a disproportionate uh, motivation would have been paying for the long LCM program uh, and using kind of a co-development plus co-promotion deal to help finance that. Uh, for Janssen, obviously the, uh, the hopefully the rationale is pretty obvious, a pretty high potential asset, X, X, XUS, excuse me, uh, rights exclusively and natural synergy with um, with the hematology uh, sales force that they already had via Belcade. So financial structure, uh, nothing uh, I think that uh, unusual here. Uh, I think it was a, a profit share. We'll talk more about profit share versus royalty structure uh, in a bit. Uh, in terms of uh, decision rights, you can see a little bit more spelled out here. Consensus first, uh, clear conflict escalation to a JSC, executive office, then quote, mutually agreeable third party expert. So we'll talk about in a bit the uh, pluses and minuses of um, uh, of arbitration and mediation. I think they're a little bit different in terms of context, but uh, unfortunately, as much as you, uh, you, nobody wants to go down that path, you, you do have to kind of understand here's here's where it all leads to eventually to uh, to get Copermo governance effective. Uh, so I'll quickly kind of like hit through some of the details on, on pharmacyclics here. I think long story short, it was kind of a hockey stick uptake. Obviously, the launch was uh, pretty successful on very short notice, and uh, and quickly I think they exited obviously to uh, to AbbVie. Um, in terms of the uh, the FTE split, you can see down below is roughly 50-50 between the two sides. So same thing here. You know, you would have expected historically Janssen as a company with an existing hematology asset that they would dominate the commercial effort. But at least on a Salesforce basis, that's not what we see. We see it was relatively evenly split between the uh, the two sides. I think the most important part of the story is that clinical bar that you see there. So a significant development program, a long LCM tail. And so therefore, a lot of the uh, the decisions made by both sides, certainly first for pharmacyclics and their financing, second in terms of their commercial footprint, uh, and certainly for Janssen for their commercial footprint as well, that a lot of the decisions here would have been backed up to a, a pretty long LCM pipeline for Ambrovica. All right, so let's quickly talk uh, through some of the, uh, the, the considerations here when designing. I think we try to group into a couple of buckets. One, the commercial strategy. Two, the co-promote strategy. Uh, and then three, the uh, deal evaluation aspect. So um, I, I'm not going to go through kind of all of the independent questions here. I mean, one, one way to look at it as value maximizing strategy, the objective specific to the co-promote design. And then third, how do we... Uh, evaluate a particular partner? How do we make sure that a particular partner aligns with our thesis? So uh, objectively, I think if you look at Copermont negotiations, you kind of are, are centering around five key areas. So obviously there's the financial aspect, what's ever in the term sheet and eventually in an operating agreement to the operational side. So who's responsible for what? Uh, three, of course, geography is included. And how do we handle LCM indications, including follow-up? indications for a lead asset, uh, and then last on the governance side, so both the structure and then mechanism for dispute resolution. 
Um, I think the first question on uh, on term sheet often is, you know, is this a profit sharing agreement or royalty agreement? So I think most people equate co-promote deals with only being a profit sharing arrangement. Um, that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, there are plenty of royalty deals here. So uh, what's the advantage of a profit sharing deal? Uh, so on the uh, one set, one hand, it kind of better aligns cost and profit, if you will, between the two sides. Both sides are aware of what's going in to each. Um, the downside is, of course, you have to continuously align on whether or not both sides are making value-add investments, e.g., you know, you can't spend the money and put it in the co-promote, uh, kick it into the kitty unless I agree with you. Uh, on a royalty basis, of course, you take that, that whole uh, piece out. So essentially, one side is incentivized on a royalty stream. They have very specific terms they have to execute against. How much it costs them really is not a material issue to the other side. So I think that's the, the trade-off there. Of course, the downside with the royalty is that one side may not see as, as incentivizing enough. Obviously, they don't reap the full upside if they're only paid on a royalty basis. So I think you can you see kind of the pluses and minuses on on both sides. And um, if in fact, if you look at the actual data here, uh, just maybe as an example, we took uh, the standpoint of development stage companies uh, and from development stage companies, what they are choosing, whether to, to go it alone or co-promote, uh, just to give you some exam example here of all the companies that essentially commercialized their asset for the first time over about a 10 year or nine year period, you've got about 56 examples. There's about eight that chose to uh, to co-promote. So what we're gonna do now is zoom in on the co-promote choices of those companies, particularly with respect to the, uh, the term sheet. So on a term sheet basis, if you look at those eight companies that uh, three of the eight uh, chose to uh, to do it as a royalty deal, uh, with the range of royalty being anywhere from 10 to 35 percent. Five of the eight choose uh, what I would consider to be a traditional profit sharing structure. Uh, what's probably more interesting uh, in terms of revenue booking front, you know, historically we equate who books revenue not just with the regulatory submission, but also frankly who's the bigger fish, you know, the larger larger company that would typically book revenue. Uh, well, if you look at the data, it's not actually true all the time. You actually see a lot of development stage companies, at least in this case, three who for the co-promote geographies did retain revenue booking. So of course, revenue booking, I think uh, for a development stage company or for a larger company, I mean, the goal obviously is to book as high a revenue figure for, uh, frankly, for investor relations uh, as, as humanly possible. Uh, and so it doesn't necessarily have to be a concession on the behalf of a development stage company. There's plenty of precedent for development stage companies who do retain booking rights in their, uh, in their target geographies. Uh, when it comes to the operational aspect, um, there's quite a bit to uh, to be able to talk through. And I think this is actually where a lot of co-promote deals fail, that um, that there isn't adequate coverage across all these different functions. So usually what happens in a term sheet discussion, and frankly, a lot of times in the operating agreement, you'll see a disproportionate skew towards, okay, what is the sales force going to do? Just because it's the single biggest line item in the SG&A build. Uh, you can see here, there's other topics that are equally important. So example, who's negotiating price? When, when you go to payers and you go to institutions, who's responsible for that? Uh, who Whose branding are you using? Usually that's a, a major hang up point. Who is procuring data? So how do you make sure that both sides are being fed intelligence uh, and it is one side or the other, essentially almost like a stage gate to data and intelligence by having to go through from one side to the other? So all of these issues matter. I think instead of just focusing on the sales operation because it's the lion's share of the spend, uh, it's solving for all of these um, is, uh, is critically important. I'm gonna pause here. I think I'm seeing a lot of questions in the, uh, in the chat about operating questions. I think one question was, uh, are mirror territories possible in co-promotes? Uh, is the script data reliable enough to allocate uh, sales to company one versus company two? That's a great question. And I would say it's so much of a great question that in Europe, they actually devised a mechanism to deal with it almost exclusively. Uh, for those who have done European co-marketing deals, uh, in Europe, you can actually essentially issue dual MDAs for the same product. Uh, and what that allows you to do is, I think, exactly like the question uh, phrases, be able to track uh, essentially efforts all the way down to the product level for one company versus another. In cases where two companies are co-promoting products, that's not necessarily as straightforward. Uh, the Easiest way to kind of allocate, obviously, is just based on effort delivered. You know, how many calls, one one side or the other. That, that's a traditional thinking. Um, to be honest, we don't see that as useful as much anymore. I think the nature of the selling environment is very different. It doesn't really translate well for oncology or other areas where it's not really a, a reach and frequency model. 
Um, and so what, what's usually better in that circumstance is to kind of align with the incentive compensation rates. So if, if uh, someone's being paid 30%, that, uh, that in terms of the, uh, the credit that you get for cost, that you kind of align up to the incentive compensation rates. From the standpoint of uh, the script data, that, that becomes a little bit more of a tricky exercise. Uh, essentially, the best way you could do it really in that case is really on a on a on the basis of uh, uh, of effort. Uh, but uh, I think by the same token, you know, usually we're actually trying to design the situation so that you don't have a ton of overlap. So, for example, how much are we sending two companies sales reps to the same doctor? You know, should we be sending them to different doctors and essentially subdividing the universe? Usually, you try to get to the highest value targets. So okay, both sides probably want to talk to those. Those physicians, but um, that they essentially try to subdivide, you know, the, the middle and low and uh, lower value targets, such that, um, frankly, we're not double uh, double effort on every single doctor. Uh, I think the other question was, I don't see Content Hub. Um, I think, uh, or excuse me, I think that was a question on, actually on sharing of material. I'm, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, I think also content obviously is a, a huge part of co promote effort as well. How do people build content? Uh, generally speaking, when you lay out these dimensions, you think you're trying to compare across four things, uh, strategic fit, effectiveness, efficiency, and manageability. Uh, I think the uh, the intuitive, uh, intuition is pretty obvious, but I think in terms of how to stretch these operational dimensions, you kind of ask all four questions. So I'm just going to give kind of a targeted example here. Uh, in terms of the layering out folks that are in the field, there's a lot of different structures. You can mirror you can cherry pick and what we, what we mean cherry pick here is literally you know which which uh, customer responsibility uh, do you have from each side so I think the uh, advantages of and disadvantages of these are specific to the context of each company you know one company is large and has a footprint in every possible doctor okay well then in that case it's very difficult to cherry pick per se so uh, usually what we're seeing is uh, that uh, that companies are trying to generally speaking subdivide the majority of the universe I think the traditional you know mirror across the board really was the legacy of large primary care portfolios that's usually not the case anymore uh, and that essentially the extent to which two companies mirror is is predominantly uh, to two companies that uh, that value certain high value targets. That's usually their primary focus. Uh, where pricing lies is usually a, a negotiating ploy. I think you can imagine a lot of tension. Um, whoever controls pricing essentially controls the future of the asset. Usually the originator is pretty reticent to uh, to give up full control of pricing. Obviously it inf impacts your LCM programs if you give up on pricing too soon. Uh, I'm going to skip forward just for the sake of time here. Uh, usually when you pick a partner, you need to pick a partner where the fit is obvious, and particularly you're avoiding LCM conflicts. So if your asset has a clear uh, upside and a follow-on indication, you want to make sure that the other side isn't going to develop something that would compete with you, frankly, in that same indication. Usually governance process is some combination of upfront planning and operational where you can imagine like a doing an annual brand plan of sorts and then uh, iterating on it throughout the year with decisions that need to be made. And as those decisions need to be made over the course of the year, that there's some dispute resolution uh, mechanism. So the way it kind of typically transpires, usually there's a JCC that drives. Uh, there's a functional subcommittee that uh, where a lot of the work gets done, frankly. So pricing, sales strategy, marketing, it eventually leads to this overall brand plan. That brand plan essentially gives both sides autonomy to execute. It's very critical that both sides be able to execute independently such that uh, that they're able to do functional level work without necessarily having to always go backwards to the JCC every time. In the event that, uh, that things don't work out, uh, you can see some of the decision making uh, mechanisms here. So unanimous majority decision, neutral arbitration and so forth. Usually escalation is kind of a, a very senior person on both sides. Um, the, Independent arbitrator is kind of the last stake. Uh, usually arbitration, the, the primary mechanism there is to scare people away to not use it. I think it's very time consuming. Everything comes to a grinding halt. It can be very challenging. So I think the uh, additional mechanisms you can see there below, I think equity holdings are a common one, for example, that people would do with development stage companies to make sure that there's some degree of interdependence. So to kind of uh, wrap up here, uh, you can kind of see there's a lot of things that drive a successful co-promote agreement, uh, the potential of the aspect, the desire for smaller cash outlay. I mean, these are all reasons why someone would do it. The barriers, obviously, is alignment between the two sides. Do you agree? How do we share the upside? Operationally, how do we fold our two organizations in together? So I think uh, it's critical to kind of look at both the upside and the barriers to address and therefore design an effective operating agreement in your co-promote. 
So I think with uh, with that, I think we're at time here. Uh, I think for those who are joining, I think believe there's a Zoom follow up after afterward, and I look forward to speaking with uh, with folks then. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you again for your participation in this session. Uh, thank you to Cody. Great job. Really informative information. Um, just a reminder that this session will be on the on demand, so you will be able to view uh, all the details uh, of the session on the on demand portion as well. Um, right now, we're going to hop into the Zoom. Uh, we hope you will join us because if you have any additional questions, you can always address those with our speakers from the previous two panels. And I look forward to seeing you there. And then we'll start back here in the main theater for the next presentation uh, at 2.15. So thank you. See you in a few.